Hi, um, this is a video and audio recording for my latest journal article with two co-authors, Federico Rossano and Richard Moore. We've been working on this paper for a long time. Um, it, we started talking about it at the International Primatological Society meeting in Chicago in 2016. Um, and are trying to reconcile some of the different ways um, that we've historically thought about how great apes acquire gesture, um, where these gestural forms come from, and what we think might be uh, like a, a new alternative view to it. So this article published in Biological Reviews this year, 2024, um, is titled The Origin of Great Ape Gestural Forms. The Abstract. Two views claim to account for the origins of great ape gestural forms. On the Leipzig view, gestural forms are ontogenetically ritualized from action sequences between pairs of individuals. On the St. Andrew's view, gestures are the product of natural selection for shared gestural forms. The Leipzig view predicts within and between group differences between gestural forms that arise as a product of learning in ontogeny. The St. Andrew's view predicts universal gestural forms comprehensible within and between species that arise because gestural forms were a target of natural selection. We reject both accounts and propose an alternative recruitment view of the origins of great ape gestures. According to the recruitment view, great ape gestures recruit features of their existing behavioural repertoire for communicative purposes. Their gestures inherit their communicative functions from visual and sometimes tactile presentations of familiar and easily recognisable action schemas and states and parts of the body. To the extent that great ape species possess similar bodies, this predicts mutual comprehensibility within and between species but without supposing that gestural forms were themselves targets of natural selection. Additionally, we locate great ape gestural communication within a pragmatic framework that is continuous with human communication and make testable predictions for adjudicating between the three alternative views. We propose that the recruitment view best explains existing data and does so within a mechanistic framework that emphasizes continuity between human and great ape communication. Introduction. In the study of the origins of great ape gestural repertoires, two views predominate. On the first, historically older view, which we call the Leipzig view, great ape gestures are a product of ontogenetic ritualization. On the ritualization view, non-human great apes learn to use gestures, but not in the same way that children learn to use words. Rather, gestural signs emerge through repeated dyadic interactions between pairs of individuals as non-communicative actions become progressively conventionalized, turning into signals that acquire communicative properties. Gestural signs are therefore acquired in ontogeny through processes of interaction and are often specific to pairs of communicators. According to the rival St. Andrew's view, the great ape gestural repertoire is not learned in ontogeny but is a product of our biological inheritance. On this view, gestures are taken to be species general communicative signals that emerged under natural selection for particular gestural forms. Because of our shared genetic inheritance, the five great ape species, including humans, are taken to have substantially overlapping gestural repertoires. Here my work contributes to this view, right? The last common ancestor of humans and orangutans, um, the great ape species to which we are most distantly related, had a small gestural repertoire that incrementally expanded during evolutionary history. The result is a much larger but still overlapping gestural repertoires in chimpanzees and bonobos and a potentially larger but still genetically inherited repertoire in humans, although this may have fallen into disuse following the emergence of natural languages. Herein we propose a new hybrid view which we call the recruitment view. According to this view, great apes recruit visually salient and largely shared postures, intentional movements that correspond to parts of familiar action schemas, for example, reaching up towards another in preparation for climbing up onto them, 
uh, bodily parts, like locations on an individual's body, shoulders to be groomed, uh, and states of the body, temporary changes in physiology, like erect genitalia or piloerect fur. For communicative purposes, showing these to express their communicative goals. The recruitment view works slightly differently in the three different types of gestures we describe. In the first kind, the feature recruited for communicative means is part of a familiar action schema. In the second type, it is a body part or state of the body. In the third case, a tactile gesture corresponds to a mechanically effective version of the same action. For example, a gentle nudge is used communicatively to move someone instead of pushing them into place forcefully. Nonetheless, in each case, the feature recruited for communicative use is a familiar and contextually interpretable feature of non-communicative great ape interactions. We retain from both the Leipzig and St. Andrew's views the idea that great ape gestures are often related to familiar action sequences and that the meanings of gestures can typically be specified in terms of the actions they are used to solicit. However, we argue against the claim of the Leipzig view that the communicative function of gestures arises through repeated dyadic interactions that shape the gestural form, and we reject the St. Andrew's view that the cross-species similarity of gestures is a byproduct of natural selection for gestural forms specifically. Rather, we argue that gestural forms are recruited from existing non-communicative behaviours, action sequences and bodily states, and then used for communicative purposes. To the extent that the bodies of great apes are largely similar and that they perform similar actions in pursuit of similar goals, great ape gestures may be understood by members of their own and other great ape species without the need for any history of interaction and ritualization between pairs of individuals. Thus, the recruitment view predicts mutual comprehension between strangers even without a shared learning history. To the extent that great ape gestures inherit their communicative functions from species general action schemas and familiar bodily states, they may also be comprehensible by humans, even those who lack experience of observing great ape interactions, like in the Great Ape Dictionary paper. By explaining the mutual comprehensibility of great ape gestures in this way, we avoid what we take to be unwarranted adaptationist tendency of the St. Andrew's view, while still accounting for the similarity in form and function of many great ape gestures. We support our proposal with illustrative examples of the visual features of gestures from the great ape repertoire and make explicit testable predictions about all three views. Finally, we elaborate on more detailed account of the cognitive mechanisms that support gestural communication on the view that we defend. We do not claim that our account extends to an explanation of great ape vocal co communication, but it may be a suitable model for characterizing the gestural interactions of other species. Before developing our own account, we consider the existing explanations in more detail. The Leipzig view, onto genetic ritualization. The first influential account of the origins of great ape gestures was developed by Tomasello et al. and Colin Tomasello using insights drawn from Tin Bergen and Ploy. On the ontogenetic ritualization view, there are two varieties of ape gesture intention movement signals and attention getters. Intention movement signals are ritualized from non-communicative behaviors and emerge spontaneously in dyadic interactions between individuals who interact frequently. Processes of ritualization can arise as follows, where individual A performs action alpha and B responds by performing beta. After repeated interactions, partners can anticipate one another's behavior. Thus, B might start to perform beta before A has finished performing alpha. Since B can now grasp A's intended action when she performs only part of alpha, over time A need no longer perform all of alpha when wanting to solicit B to perform beta. Instead, A can perform only the first part of alpha and rely on B anticipating what she wants and producing beta in response. Thus A can produce the first part of alpha as a sign um, with the communicative function of soliciting response beta from B. In this account, gestures emerge through repeated interactions wherein both signaler and recipient learn that an intended outcome can be achieved by this particular truncated action, now a gesture. 
The intended outcome is the starting point and gestures are learned through this ritualization process as a means to achieving the intended outcome more efficiently. There is empirical support for the hypothesis that at least some great ape gestures can be ontogenetically ritualized. For example, a study of mother-infant interactions in captive bonobos showed that some gestures learned by infant bonobos are ritualized from non-communicative actions related to the initiation of particular movements. Um, and this was work that one of the co-authors on this paper, Federico Rossano, was involved in. A similar pattern can be observed in wild infant chimpanzees in the development of gestures they use to elicit joint locomotion with their mothers. Although since publishing the latter study, some of its authors have reinterpreted their findings as evidence that social experience is required for the emergence of gesture rather than ontogenetic ritualization. The ontogenetic ritualization hypothesis makes certain predictions that differentiate it from alternative views of the origins of great ape gestures. For example, since gestural signs are ritualized from repeated interactions between pairs of individuals, there may be significant variation between the gestures used by different pairs of individuals, so-called idiosyncratic gestures. The simplest way in which this might occur is that individuals ritualize their gestures to different points in the action schema, with some gestures thus representing the action more or less completely. Alternatively, suppose that two individuals in a group engage in a variant of a common action sequence that differs from the equivalent action performed by other members of the group. While the other members of the group perform action alpha to elicit beta, um, one individual in this group performs alpha one. Here, the ritualization hypothesis predicts that the idiosyncratic individuals may produce a different gesture to elicit beta from other members of the same group. Individuals may also use different gestures for the same function um, when communicating with individuals with whom they have a different history of interactions. Early evidence for idiosyncratic gestures came from small captive populations of chimpanzees where only certain individuals used certain gestures in certain study periods. Many studies do report rare gesture types used by one or a few individuals, which may be considered idiosyncratic, although these represent one or two gesture types in repertoires of dozens of gesture types. Here we have table one um, that shows the predictions of the two previous hypotheses claiming to account for the origins of great ape gestural forms and of the recruitment hypothesis presented herein. And you can find the full table as well in the paper that's linked below. Tomasello and others also describe a class of gestures that they call attention getters, in which great apes intentionally make a noise or perform an action that solicits attention to themselves from their interlocutor. This can be done for a variety of reasons, including as a way of soliciting attention to features of the gesturing individuals that are not under their voluntary control. For example, piloerect fur, threat displays, and erect genitalia. Thus, the performance of attention getters serves to amplify the significance of these states and presents them to interlocutors with a communicative function. Nonetheless, evidence for the existence of attention getters is mixed. Hobater and Byrne argue that no gestures in the repertoire that they analyzed were performed exclusively to solicit attention. They achieved other behavioral goals too. For that reason, we do not here follow Tomasello in assuming that great ape gestures can be described in terms of the dichotomy of attention getters and intention movement signals. The St. Andrews view, a biologically inherited communicative repertoire. As part of an ambitious program to record and analyze the gestural repertoires of all four non-human great ape species, and in response to the ritualization hypothesis defended by the Leipzig School, Byrne and colleagues formulated the St. Andrew's explanation of gestural origins. A key premise of their account is that claims about the idiosyncrasy of pair-specific gestures between great apes were driven largely by the small sizes of early studies. They argue that with more sustained, larger scale observations, gestural repertoires are found to overlap almost entirely across members of each great ape species. Moreover, they argue there is large overlap in gestural repertoires across great ape species. Gestures used by pan, bonobos and chimpanzees, 
are also used by both gorillas and orangutans, and even in humans. Given that the gesture used by non-human great apes constitute only a small subset, 70 to 90, of the 1,000 plus gestures estimated to be morphologically possible, like all of the action body part combinations they could feasibly do, Burn et al. state that this convergence is unlikely to be a coincidence. Rather, it is taken to be an indicator of a common biological descent. Thus, on this hypothesis, particular gestural forms are argued to have undergone selection processes, perhaps via phylogenetic ritualization, through which they have become associated with particular communicative functions. This account therefore reflects the view that in the evolutionary sciences, the primary mode of explanation should be the identification of processes of natural selection through which behavioral traits have emerged. It also treats great ape gestures in the same manner that their vocalizations have traditionally been studied, namely as products of natural selection. On the St. Andrew's view, individuals also produce their gestures with certain goals, but the gestures with which they seek these goals are part of a genetically inherited repertoire. Ontogeny is not taken to be irrelevant to the process of gesture acquisition. Since many gestures have multiple uses, juvenile learners may still need to experiment with gestures to identify the best ways in which to use them. Hobater and Byrne found that young chimpanzees produce sequences of gestures in pursuit of a single goal. As they age, individuals make more frequent use of the most effective gestures, potentially due to the pruning of less effective ones, with adult individuals using fewer gesture sequences than immature individuals. Nonetheless, the St. Andrew's view holds that both the gestural forms and semantic features, i.e. communicative functions of great ape gestures, are an unlearned product of our biological inheritance. Byrne and colleagues are right that in the evolutionary sciences, the default hypothesis is to look for adaptive explanations of behaviour. Often, this explanatory strategy takes the form of researchers identifying species general behavioural traits and hypothesising explanations with ecological reasons that made these traits adaptive in a species evolutionary history, and then arguing that these traits became targets of natural selection processes. The same strategy can also be used to explain the appearance of similar traits in closely related species. Traits that appear in neighbouring clades are hypothesised to be the result of processes of adaptation by natural selection in an ancestral group. However, contra Byrne and colleagues, we need not assume that the gestural forms were themselves the targets of natural selection, even though great ape bodies are products of many complex and overlapping adaptive processes we think it more appropriate to characterize them as exaptations. On the view that we propose, the great ape gestural repertoire consists of acts of showing, that is, of communicative presentations of familiar postures and parts and states of the body. In such cases, the goals of these communicative acts, i.e. the messages with which they are produced, are closely associated with features of the shown postures, parts and states, making the utterances easily interpretable, even in interactions between unfamiliar individuals. We need not think of these bodily action schemas, parts and states as having undergone selection for their communicative function. Rather, because they are already present in the great ape non-communicative repertoire, they can be recruited for communicative purposes. For example, erect genitalia can be shown or addressed to interlocutors to communicate sexual interest or familiar parts of action sequences shown to others by virtue of being addressed to them uh, to solicit responses appropriate to these actions. Empirical evidence for the recruitment view. The above section set out our theoretical rationale for rejecting both the Leipzig and St. Andrew's accounts of the origins of great ape gestures. We now illustrate how the positive account we propose is consistent with existing empirical studies of great ape gesture forms. We present evidence that some great ape gestures resemble the actions about which they are used to communicate, and that others show bodily parts and states of the body that are connected to the gesture's communicative functions. In both types of these gestures, their function and interpretability are driven by showing salient visual features that correspond to the communicated behaviour. In a third kind of gesture we describe, interpretation is supported not by visual but tactile features. 
In section 5, we try to disambiguate further the account that we have proposed from existing views by making some predictions about the different commitments that might be entailed by the Leipzig, St. Andrews and recruitment views of great ape gestural origins. We do this to sketch ways in which further empirical evidence might be collected to establish which view gives the best account of gestural origins. In the examples below, we elaborate on the kinds of resemblance that we think are fundamental to great ape gestural communication and illustrate our claim with examples. One, presenting action schemas. Many great ape gestures visually recall the actions with which their communicative function is associated, often by visually resembling parts of an action schema. Typically, these gestures correspond to what Tomasello calls intention movement signals, although for reasons described in section two, we do not adopt his distinction between attention getters and intention movement signals. We recognize that there are limits to what should count as resemblance since otherwise the term may be emptied of explanatory power. Everything resembles everything else in some respect. The notion of resemblance used herein is not fully worked out, but it is comparable to the idea of resemblance adopted in other accounts of iconic features of great ape communication, where authors appealed to the idea of a resemblance between the form and meaning of a gesture. The idea that we wish to convey is that for a large set of chimpanzee gestures, the form of the gesture corresponds to part of an action sequence that could serve as a meaning to the fulfillment of the gesture's goal, and that this similarity is salient to the intended recipient of the gesture. Our point is best illustrated with examples. For example, in making a begging gesture, chimpanzees often hold their hand towards the mouth of the individual for whom they are begging so that their interlocutor might drop or spit some food from their own mouths into the chimpanzee's hand. This is like a mouth stroke. They reach out and touch the mouth of the other individual. The familiar chimpanzee palm up begging gesture thus resembles the act of taking food from or reaching for the mouth of a peer, since in the process of taking food from that mouth, the taker's hand occupies a similar position to the one used in the begging gesture. Similarly, a young bonobo's arms up, climb on gesture in which the gesture's hand or hands reach upwards to its mother's chest or back, visually resembles the act of her climbing up onto her mother. And in the rocking gesture, bonobos reproduce movements that occur during sexual intercourse. These resemblances are likely salient to the intended recipients of gestures. In these kinds of gestures, we can think of great apes as showing their interlocutors action schemas and body postures that are means to the performance of the actions that the gestures are used to convey. These gestures thus visually resemble the actions that are, they are used to communicate about. They can be used communicatively by being addressed to the attention of an interlocutor, typically by using eye contact and producing the gesture in the direction of the intended recipient in a manner intended to elicit a response to the gestures. These gestures are typically used to solicit actions that will contribute to the fulfillment of the gesture's goal. For example, in the case of a begging gesture, an individual might let food drop from their mouth into the outstretched hand of the gesture. In the case of the climb on gesture, uh, the recipient might extend a part of their own body towards the gesture to facilitate their efforts to climb onto them. Um, and in figure one, I'll pop that on the screen now, we have a selection of chimpanzee and bonobo gestures and the outcomes that they achieve. Uh, we have a mouth stroke gesture illustrated, um, a reach gesture, a rocking gesture, um, and a big loud scratch gesture. They're shown to resemble grooming as well. The Leipzig view posits that the communicative function of these gestures arises through a process of ontogenetic ritualization. Although as signs are ritualized, the familiar action sequences from which gestures are ritualized may become harder to recognize. The St. Andrew's view invokes phylogenetic ritualization to explain any resemblance between gestural form and function. However, we argue that since these gestures visually resemble elements of the action sequences that they are used to initiate, they need neither be learned nor explained as a product of phylogenetic ritualization. Rather, by virtue of their possessing similar bodies and recognizing the same actions, individuals may recognize the functions of gestures as connected to familiar action sequences, even when the gestures are performed by unfamiliar individuals 
and without any shared learning history. As a result, these gestures may be easily interpretable as having semantic properties closely connected to the actions or parts of action sequences that they resemble. These gestures can also be performed by individuals who recognize an association between their own body postures and the performance of certain kinds of goal-directed actions. For this to be possible, users need some basic familiarity with, experience of, the kinds of bodies and action schemas depicted in the gestural performances. However, since relevant non-communicative experience will make the functions of gestures easily recognizable, it is unnecessary to suppose that the communicative function of these gestures is secured by ritualization in either ontogeny or phylogeny. To propose that great ape gestures acquire their semantic properties by resembling the actions with which they are associated is not to claim that these gestures are iconic in the fullest sense of the word. Thus, while some have argued that some great apes do not produce and understand iconic gestures, we do not and need not claim this. Iconic gestures are often characterized as those which are produced with the intention visually to recreate an action schema for communicative purposes. While great ape gestures are both intentionally produced and visually resemble action schemas, we do not suppose that great apes need to be reflectively aware of this resemblance for their gestures to be successful. That is, we do not suppose that gesture selection is guided by a meta-representational process in which the gesturer intends that her audience recognize that her gesture resembles an action that is connected to her communicative goals. Rather, it may be that because these body postures are already associated with the performance of certain actions through the repeated experience of their co-occurrence, Recreating them becomes an intuitive, unreflective choice for agents engaged in the gesture selection process. Nonetheless, there is clearly an analogy between our own account of the origins of great ape gestures and Charles Sanders Pierce's account of icons, signs whose interpretation is mediated by a visual likeness. On our account, it is a visual and sometimes tactile resemblance that forges the association between a gesture and its function rather than a history of ritualization. Two, showing body parts. In a second type of great ape gesture, the signaler shows a body part to the recipient. In the past, these have been circularly defined by the outcome that they achieve. Present climb on, present grooming, present sexual. Uh, these will be familiar if you've read any of my other papers. Uh, sometimes present sexual is split as present genitals forward or present genitals backward. It may be more informative to look at the body part that is presented and the body part that the recipient interacts with. We have also identified the arm up gesture as one that potentially presents part of the body, i.e. by exposing the individual's front and side for the recipient to interact with, as the main outcome was initiate contact. Bipedal stance could also be considered as a modified version of present sexual with the signaler standing while presenting their full front and genitals to the recipient. And here we have figure two, which again is a selection of gestures that show the part of the body with which the recipient should interact. Here we have the arm up that presents the side. We have a bipedal stance that presents the full front and genitals, uh, a present climb on where an arm is presented um, a present grooming where an arm again is presented and a present sexual where the genitals are presented. This set of gestures may function like Tomasello's attention getters, although we do not claim that their sole function of such gestures is to solicit attention in a non-specific way. Rather, we propose that the contents of attention soliciting messages are provided by implicit reference to accompanying contextual features of the utterances, potentially including objects, locations, and the concurrent presence of bodily states that are not under intentional control, but to which great apes draw their interlocutor's attention by showing or addressing them to others. <laughs> Some of the states to which individuals solicit the attention of their interlocutor can be described by reference to what uh, Baron calls expressive behaviors. These are behaviors that, whether or not they are themselves under intentional control, uh, provide insights into the state of mind of an individual in ways that could provide evidence of her accompanying goals. For example, erect fur provides insights into the, into the agitated state of an individual's mind. 
When great apes solicit attention to their bodily states or parts in the way described here, they do so to draw attention to some further goal, which is implicitly expressed through the bodily state to which they are drawing attention. For example, erect fur, erect genitalia, or body parts that they wish to be groomed. While actions that draw attention to locations and objects do not recruit states or parts of the gesturer's body, they may nonetheless function in the same way. Since the objects and locations are already likely to be salient as affording certain actions, attention-soliciting behaviours that draw attention to them will inherit their interpretability from the significance of these accompanying features. As with gestures that inherit their form from action schemas, we do not need to suppose that this repertoire of communicative acts was a target of natural selection for communicative purposes, although in some cases it may have been. Rather, individuals recruit existing features of their bodies or their environment by drawing attention to them for communicative purposes. Sometimes these features will be products of natural selection, as in the case of erect fur, erect genitalia, or emotional facial expressions. But we need not posit any further natural selection process to explain how these states are recruited by great apes for intentional communication. For example, a shoulder can be shown to another for the purpose of grooming, or a hand can be held towards another's mouth to request food, but we need not suppose that either presentation of the shoulder or the extension of the hand have undergone natural selection for communicative purposes. The existing body parts and bodily states are already significant to potential interlocutors, and individuals need only draw attention to their presence to recruit these behavioural states for communicative ends. When these gestures are addressed to others in order to solicit from them certain actions, this combination of actions makes them communicative. They are being ostensibly shown to an audience with a communicative goal. In addition, while these processes of recruitment could be learned, there is no reason to suppose that they must have been learned for their communicative functions to be interpretable. The behaviours through which non-human great apes express their communicative intentions are already likely to be universally understood, at least where these behaviours are part of the species' typical repertoire. For example, with background knowledge, experience of non-communicative social life in great ape communities, backs may be recognised as things that can be scratched, groomed or climbed upon, and genitals as part of the bodies to be engaged with sexually. As a result, communicative acts that recruit behaviours to express the communicative goals with which they are already correlated are readily interpretable. While we have categorised separately gestures that involve the recreation of parts of action sequences, those that involve showing parts or states of the body, and those involving tactile resemblance, these categories do not need to be mutually exclusive. Some gestures in the great ape repertoire may incorporate elements of both. For example, the big loud scratch gesture potentially involves the recreation of both elements of the act of scratching and draws attention to the area of the body its producer wants the interlocutor to scratch. In principle, features of different gesture types could be combined freely and their combinations would serve further to facilitate comprehension. Three, directional contact gestures. Push, or directed push, is a contact gesture where a signaler applies a force towards the recipient's body. Here, the resemblance that facilitates understanding of the communicative function of a gesture may not only be visual, but also tactile. A gesture that can both visually resemble the act of manoeuvring another and also feel like it. For example, the pull gesture, or grab pull, is a contact gesture where the signaler applies force away from the recipient's body. So we have a push towards the recipient's body and pull the forces away from the recipient's body. Both gestures likely use applied force to indicate a direction of movement for the recipient. For bonobos, directed push was used to mean climb on me in all successful instances, and for chimpanzees, the top three meanings were reposition, move closer, and climb on me. By their definition, directed push was used when the recipient moved in the direction of the force applied by the signaler. But to test this properly, future research would need to assess direction of force and direction of recipient movement. Grab-pull was coded without considering directionality, but the meanings suggest movement related to the gesturing. For bonobos, the top three meanings were follow me, reposition and climb on me. For chimpanzees, the top three meanings were move closer, climb on me and contact. Um, Here we have figure three, two gestures that direct the recipient towards a certain location. We have directed push and we have grab pull. The role of learning. 
Current theories of gesture development and use in non-human primates, mostly based on great ape data, suffer from challenges posed by empirical evidence. The Leipzig view requires extensive learning within repeated dyadic interactions, so that gestures can only be used inflexibly, both with respect to their function and with respect to the likelihood that gestures will be understood by individuals who were not part of the dyad from which the gestures emerged. This should in principle lead to an individual potentially producing different gesture types to achieve the same outcome while interacting with different individuals. It also predicts limited repertoire overlap across communities and across species because of the unpredictability of the ritualization process. However, in practice, there is large overlap in gestural repertoires across individuals, communities and species. The number of signals produced to achieve the same outcome is also rather limited and not clearly partner dependent. Therefore, the amount of learning necessary for mutually comprehensible gestural communication between great apes seems to be less than the Leipzig view would predict. The St. Andrews view, on the other hand, predicts limited redundancy in terms of the number of gestures associated with a specific meaning. Such redundancy nonetheless exists. The St. Andrews view also predicts only a limited form of learning in the form of correctly mapping innate functions, i.e. meanings to innate gestural forms, and where this mostly takes the form of giving up the use of gestures that do not solicit intended responses. Nonetheless, we know that there is some level of learning in great ape communication, at least in the context of joint locomotion and carry signals. New gestures can be and are learned. The recruitment view presents a model that can account for current empirical evidence of gestural communication in great apes without requiring ad hoc explanations for counter empirical evidence. It also requires less learning than the Leipzig view and yet accounts for both some degree of variability in the repertoire and a large amount of overlap across communities and even species. This view also avoids making the unwarranted assumption that gestural forms were themselves targets of natural selection, and it presents claims that are easily testable and potentially falsifiable. The account of great ape gestural forms that we develop here have, has some similarities with another influential recent account of the origin of great ape behavioral repertoire, Tenney's latent solutions approach. On both views, individual great apes spontaneously invent their own solutions to the challenges they encounter. In the case of gestural communication, individuals create their own gestures using gestural forms that are salient to them because they incorporate either familiar action schemas or body parts and states. By virtue of their having similar bodies, the same forms are independently salient to all because all individuals will associate, even if unreflectively, broadly the same actions with the same goals. As a result, they produce and understand one another's gestures with relative ease, and the gestures produced by different individuals are sim visually similar. This may be the case even if individuals do not select gestures because they are reflectively aware of the visual resemblance of their chosen gesture to the action specified in their intended message, and expect their interlocutor to be similar aware of the resemblance. The chosen gestures might thus be described as latent solutions to the communicative challenges for which they are used. Individuals could potentially invent gestures and still be understood because by virtue of their shared body schemas, signalers and recipients associate the same postures and body movements with the same outcomes and goals. This is not to say that there is no learning involved in the development of great ape gestural communication. As previously noted, some basic familiarity with bodies and action schemas is required, and this may be acquired during ontogeny. Additionally, as Hobater and Byrne described, there may be a period in which juveniles experiment with their gestures before they become confident in using and understanding them. The social negotiation hypothesis posits that gestures emerge from an exchange of social behaviours between interactants. While not full ontogenetic ritualization, it requires that individuals actively engage in joint behaviors with others for gestures to emerge. In this account, individuals should only produce gestures to initiate behaviors that they themselves have already engaged in with others. This differs somewhat from our account whereby having similar bodies and similar behaviors as individuals is sufficient to formulating intentions. Experience likely shapes gesturing preferences, but we would predict that individuals can use gestures to initiate behaviours with others prior to having experienced those behaviours with others. Behaviours that emerge later in development, such as sexual contact, could be used to test this prediction. 
Nevertheless, we share Pika and Froelich's view that learning need not take the form of any period of ontogenetic ritualization. We do not discount the possibility that great apes can learn new gestures, although this seems rare in captive individuals, possibly because they are not motivated to extend their communicative repertoire. If new gestures are learned, though, we predict that their communicative functions should be tied to associated action schemas or body parts and states. Tenney's failed attempt to teach untrained chimpanzees new gestures notably involved arbitrary gestural forms, which are particularly difficult for chimpanzees to learn. For all that we think visual resemblance is central to and perhaps necessary for the function and interpretation of gestures, visual resemblance alone is likely insufficient for comprehension of novel gesture action pairings. This is reflected in studies of iconicity that find low comprehension of novel gestures produced by humans. In the case of gestures that correspond to parts of action schemas, we think resemblance is made apt to be recruited for communicative means through its familiarity with a common behaviour, and because that behaviour is communicatively relevant to some ongoing interaction. There may be parts of actions that could be recruited for communication, but which relate to behaviours that are not communicatively relevant to the flow of great ape social lives. In such cases, even visually salient gestural forms might be overlooked. Furthermore, even where gestures relate to communicatively relevant interactions, unenculturated great apes, generally poor social attention, especially towards humans, might constitute a further obstacle to successful interpretation. We think great apes' poor comprehension of both human pointing and iconic gesture is likely partly attributable to their inattention to particular features of human behaviour, including potentially the orienting features and shapes of gesturing human hands. This might also undermine their ability to interpret novel gestures produced by conspecifics. Nonetheless, new gestures could potentially be innovated within groups of apes, and we predict that these would be readily interpretable without a history of ritualization. One way to test our hypothesis would be to observe whether newly seeded behaviour in a group might also give rise to communicative interactions involving gestures over time. If they do, one could subsequently seek to determine whether there is some visual resemblance between the form and function of newly created gestures. We predict that where additional gestures are learned, these will recruit either familiar action schemas and or body parts and states, and consequently that these gestures would be used and understood spontaneously by individuals familiar with the new behaviour. We concede that new gestures could also be learned through a process of ontogenetic ritualization, and we acknowledge that some elements of the repertoire of captive chimpanzees may be best explained by appeal to processes of ontogenetic ritualization. Nonetheless, such cases should be relatively rare. The recruitment view predicts that the mutual comprehensibility of most gestures in the repertoires of great ape species does not depend upon any extended period of interaction in which ontogenetic ritualization could take place. Rather, even unfamiliar individuals' gestures will be mutually comprehensible without a shared learning history on account of the visual resemblance between gestural forms and the meanings with which the gestures are used. It may also be that over time gestures initially used spontaneously become habitual such that apes need not reinvent them on each occasion of use, but this is consistent with their initially being usable without any process of ritualization. Embodied gestural communication and language evolution. We believe a further advantage of the recruitment view is its potential to contribute to debates about language evolution and particularly to pragmatics first accounts of language development. Such accounts posit that the first natural languages emerged against a background of nonverbal communicative interactions, and specifically between users who could act with and attribute communicative intentions. The St. Andrew's view provides relatively little insight into the evolution of language beyond predicting some overlap in the gestural repertoire of all great ape species. However, regarding the mechanics of production and comprehension, it presents a semantics first account of how communication works, Great apes communicate using signs that acquired both their form and function from processes of natural selection. On such an account, there is no need for agents to be able to act with and attribute communicative intent, since production and comprehension are under the control of natural selection. Thus, pragmatic interpretation may be limited to using contextual features of production to interpret a fixed repertoire of signs or calls. This kind of contextual inference, however, is on the 
is of the wrong kind to explain the evolution of language, because most theories of language evolution assume that our ancestors could act with and attribute communicative intentions prior to language development, and because knowing how to interpret signs across contexts is insufficient for acting with and interpreting communicative intent. Proponents of the Leipzig view have argued that no great ape species act with and attribute communicative intentions, entailing that the socio-cognitive abilities of ancestral hominins must have undergone substantial development before they could use and understand language. Tomasello explicitly contrasts a view of communication via ontogenetic ritualization with a view of communication via communicative intentions, and posits this as a major point of difference in the communicative abilities of humans and other great apes, explaining why only humans acquired language. This view is problematic both because it is motivated by intellectualized and misleading philosophical accounts of the nature of cognition, required for communication rather than by empirical data, and because there is clear empirical evidence that there are circumstances in which great apes can understand human communicative intentions, including some forms of language. The challenge of explaining enculturated great apes' comprehension of human communication therefore remains for both St. Andrew's and Leipzig views. By contrast, the view we have presented is consistent with another possibility. On this view, all species of great apes are capable of acting with and attributing communicative intentions, albeit in restricted ways. Specifically, we argue that there are constraints on the kinds of communicative intentions that unenculturated great apes can interpret and in attribute because the natural repertoires of these species are heavily dependent upon the bodily expression of the gesture's message and the ways in which this visually salient bodily expression supports the interpretation of communicative goals. Where these perceptually salient familiar behaviours and body postures are not present to support utterance interpretation, as in the case of pointing, which is highly ambiguous since interpretable in multiple ways, comprehension may be difficult for non-human great ape species. It may be only after substantial training or exposure to human behaviours, example through enculturation in infancy, that they become able to interpret the communicative goals behind a wider range of behaviours. This is consistent with the possibility that great apes in zoos and in the wild are poor at arbitrary symbolic forms of communication, but that they can acquire symbolic abilities through extended periods of enculturation, perhaps because of the ways in which enculturation changes great ape attention. On our proposal, we can think of great apes as acting with and, in, and attributing communicative goals, albeit in ways that are limited in comparison to humans. There are various ways in which human and great ape communicative interactions are likely to differ. Some of these are already well established in the literature. For example, great apes may act primarily with only relatively simple kinds of directive communicative goals, for example, to make requests or give orders, and with utterances produced to inform others only relatively rarely. The contents of their goals may also be simpler than ours, for example, because they do not involve complex psychological states and because they lack the syntactic complexity of human communication. Here we propose a further limitation on their communication interactions. While great apes may be able to act with and attribute communicative goals, their capacity for pragmatic interpretation is limited in comparison to ours and is dependent upon the presence of salient and easily interpretable acts parts of action schemas and parts and states of the body. To justify this claim, more needs to be said about the ways in which we conceive of ostensive inferential or Gricean communication, that is communication that involves acting with and attributing communicative intentions or goals, here we use the term interchangeably. Consistent with others, we take ostensive inferential communication to be a process in which communicators produce utterances with certain goals and ostensibly address their gestures to the attention of their intended audience, for example, by engaging them in eye contact and directing their gestures to the interlocutor's attention. On the basis of being so addressed, audience members attempt to infer the goals with which their interlocutors are producing utterances. However, as noted before, we differ from others in supposing that Gricean communication need not be socio-cognitively demanding. Once we accept that this process need not be socio-cognitively demanding, there is good reason to believe that great apes can do this. 
With respect to the process of inferring communicative goals following Mercier and Sperber, we take the process of inference to be one in which an agent makes a judgment about some state based upon incomplete evidence. In the case of communication, inferring a gesture's communicative goal will consist of making a judgment about which message they intend to communicate based upon the combination of behaviours through which their intended message is expressed and addressed. What we hypothesize herein is a constraint on the pragmatic interpretation abilities of great apes. While they may be able to attribute communicative goals to one another, they may only be able to do this where there is a strong perceptual resemblance between the gestures and the messages that the gestures are used to communicate, or where presented bodily states are easily interpretable. This is consistent with the finding that apes may be able to interpret the intentions of their interlocutors based entirely on contextual features of the interaction, with gestures acting more as a prompt to elicit a response, since there may be multiple behavioural and contextual sources from which evidence of a speaker's intentions are inferred. Nonetheless, our view suggests further predictions about the kinds of gestures that are likely to be interpreted by unenculturated great apes. The hypothesis that great apes express their communicative goals by showing others postures and bodily states requires acknowledging that showing can be a form of Gricean communication. This claim is historically controversial because Grice himself rejected it. Nonetheless, philosophers in the Gricean tradition now typically accept that showing can involve the production and interpretation of communicative intentions. For example, I may show you my black eye as a way of communicating that I have had a bad day, uh, or my broken foot as a way of saying that I will not be playing football tonight. We argue that great ape gestures regularly incorporate elements of showing, either in the form of shown action schemas or parts and states of the body, and that both their communicative function and interpretability is derived from this. This is a point of contrast with human communication. Unlike most human symbols, great ape gestures are not arbitrary. A key step in the evolution of natural languages was likely the acquisition of an ability to use and interpret arbitrary non-iconic gestural forms. Interestingly, domestic dogs also fare much better at interpreting such embodied gestures than physically similar non-bodily signs. While enculturated great apes can learn to use symbols to communicate, such symbols are not a part of their ordinary phenotypic repertoire. The view defended here thus generates a new set of predictions about the course of language evolution, identifying a key transition as the emergence of abilities for interpreting communicative intentions between a wider set of signs. Our proposal also has potential application for explaining communication in other species. It may be that what makes human communication unique is not a uniquely human ability to attribute communicative intentions, but rather our ability to interpret communicative intentions based on more limited evidence of communicative goals from the signaler. Since our approach can potentially contribute to explanations of communication in non-ape species, and even has some commonalities with influential theories of the embodied nature of linguistic metaphors in human communication, it might be thought of as a contribution to a general theory of the embodied basis of communication. Conclusions 1. Standard accounts of the origins of great ape gestural forms are unsatisfactory. The Leipzig view overestimates both the role of learning in the development of gestural forms and the amount of within and between group variation in signal use. Meanwhile, the St. Andrews view assumes, without justification, that gestural forms were themselves targets of natural selection. 2. Our novel recruitment view explains the possibility of mutual comprehension within and between great ape populations and potentially species without learning and without assuming that gestural forms are themselves a product of targeted selection. On this view, great apes communicate by showing visually salient body parts, postures and states. In addition to sketching a novel mechanistic account of great ape gesture production and comprehension, we locate this communicative behaviour within a framework of pragmatic interpretation that is continuous with human communication. On this view, both humans and great apes can act with and attribute communicative intentions. Nonetheless, non-human great apes may be strongly dependent upon the presence of visually salient and easily interpretable behaviours to facilitate their interpretation of others' communicative goals in ways that humans are not. Four. This framework for explaining gestural communication in great apes could potentially be applied to other species. Acknowledgements. For helpful comments on this review, we are indebted to Dorit Baron, Manuel Bon, Ron Planer, and Kim Sterelny.
Richard's research is supported by UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship Grant. Um, and my research was funded um, under the uh, ERC Horizon 2020 uh, grant. And this is going to have so many references. I am scrolling through them now. Um, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this paper. This is one that I've been really excited about. Um, I think it's a nice, I well, I hope it's a nice like overview of what we have thought about the origins of great ape gestures for a while, but also one that kind of launches us into, uh, yeah, thinking more about, okay, if we're talking about inheritance, what is inherited? Um, if we're talking about learning, what is learned? Um, it seems more than time to be moving beyond this learned or inherited dichotomy um, and thinking about like what is it that's salient to the apes, um, how do they understand one another's communication um, and I think yeah really excited to continue along this line uh, in future. So take care, have a good day. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Bye.